The, uh, the central section of Hebrews, that's where we are, but I always like to introduce the thing, get us back up to what we're talking about. The central section of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 14 through chapter 10, 25, is an exposition on the high priesthood, the great high priesthood of Jesus. And that's where that's, we're looking at that, but what we looked at last week in the first few verses of that section, chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, we're told that we have a sinless high priest who's gone into heaven, and that we therefore must hold firmly to the faith and draw near to God. We need to do that because we have Jesus ministering in heaven itself. We need to hold firmly to the faith, otherwise his ministry will be of no benefit to us. And in chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, we see that Jesus, uh, Jesus was taken from among men. He is a man. He's, of course, the God-man. But he's taken from among men and appointed high priest on the order of Melchizedek. This uh, enigmatic figure we're going to talk about a bit more when we get to chapter 7. But he's on this, he's in this, this central exposition on the great high priesthood of Jesus. He goes through, starts at chapter 4, verse 14, goes for a few verses down through verse 10 of chapter 5. And then we get another one of these hortatory interjections where he's going to pause and exhort us, and warn us, and encourage us to act on the things that he's saying. And that picks up in chapter 5, verse 11, and it runs down through the end of chapter 6. And then in chapter 7, he resumes, uh, picks back up with the Christ-Melchizedek parallel, and then he continues with the theme of Christ's high priesthood down through chapter 10, verse 25. So 414 through 1025 is this exposition on the great high priesthood of Christ, with this hortatory interjection in chapter 5, verse 11, through chapter 6, verse 20. And we're in the middle of this, or just started really, this, uh, this section, this interjection of exhortation. And so I'll pick back up there a little bit and remind you of some of what we said there. In, in chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, he confronts his hearers. Okay, remember, this is really like a sermon, though it's written. It's, it's really a, a written sermon. He, he appeals to people hearing things. He has more to say about Christ's high priesthood as a Melchizedekian kind of priesthood, but before continuing that, he challenges his readers. Okay, he's got more to say on this subject, but he then pauses, listen, uh, I'm going to challenge you to apply yourselves. And he does that, see, by rebuking them for having regressed to a state of spiritual immaturity. He says, you guys have gone backward. And so he's doing this, he, he's urging them, he's shaming them, really. And he's doing it, though, see, to wake them up, to motivate them to come out of and to repent of this infant mindset into which they've slid. And he's doing that that they may be able to absorb the more solid food that he's giving them. So it's the kind of thing, of it's, it's something that he wants them to come out of and repent of. You see, they've just gotten lazy and they've drifted back into an infant mindset. So he essentially is shaming them to get them to wake up because he has more to say about this. But he tells them that in 11 through 14, and then rather than being content with and only interested in an infant's diet of Christian truth, you know, the ABCs of the Christian faith, they need to move beyond those things and allow God to move them to a fuller, deeper understanding of the faith. Okay, then in chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, he lists three pairs of teachings that he includes among the basic things. These look like couplets. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 says, therefore... Having left the teaching of the elemental things of, of the Christ, let us be moved on toward completeness, not again laying a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of teachings, teaching of immersions and of the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And we will do this if God permits. Okay, so he's, he's, he's telling them here, he lists these couplets of basic teachings. He says, listen, you have to go on beyond these things. I have meteor things to tell you, but you cannot park on the basics of the Christian faith and be content with that. You have to shake off that mindset. He then lists these illustrations or examples of basic teachings. And you have these three pairs, and we talked about the first pair last week, repentance of dead works and faith toward God. This refers to a turning away from sinful conduct and a turning toward God in faith and obedience, which, of course, they would understand involves uh, submission to Christ and trust in Christ. 
So this is a very a, a basic thing. It's the personal and in, internal aspect of conversion. See these couplets I mentioned last week. This fellow Craig Coaster, who's a, a commentator, wrote the commentary on Hebrews in the Anchor Bible series. His statement is, is that you have in these, these six items, these three pairs, he says, span the journey of faith from initial repentance to final judgment. And see, the first set here, where you have this idea of repentance of dead works and faith toward God, it's the personal and internal aspect of conversion. Okay, personal and internal, where I, I turn from the dead works, I turn to God in faith and obedience, and then the second pair we get are instructions about immersions and the laying on of hands. Now, I'll tell you how I understand this. And okay, so you weigh what I have to say about it. If you think it's wrong, as I always say, then you just give it the boot. Okay, but I want to tell you what I think is going on here. First, I think it refers to baptism and the laying on of hands that's associated with it. It's the corporate and external aspect of conversion. Okay, faith, repentance, and faith toward God is the personal and internal aspect of conversion. Baptisms and the laying on of hands is the corporate and external aspect of conversion. Now, the word that I've translated here, I did it immersions, okay, where he, have, he sits here, foundation, repentance, and teachings of immersions. That's, that's oftentimes it's translated as baptisms or washings or ablutions. Just depends on which, uh, which translation you have. But it's the word baptismos. And the Hebrew writer uses that same word in chapter 9, verse 10 in reference to Jewish ceremonial washings. It's not the normal word that's used for Christian baptism. That is baptisma. Okay, this is baptismos. That word is baptisma. But you do have baptismos used to refer to Christian baptism in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. So it can be used that way. But here it, it, I translated immersions. However you translate it, it's plural. And that causes people, you know, some why is it plural? Instructions about baptisms. So whether you say it's immersions, baptisms, ablutions, it's plural. Okay, and I think that it's plural along with many commentators. I think it's plural probably because the instruction about baptism distinguished Christian baptism from other cleansing rites of the ancient world, particularly those of Judaism. So when you were being instructed about baptisms, it involved distinguishing Christian baptism from a world of other immersion rites. And so he uses it as a plural sense, okay? Instructions about baptisms, that's what I think, meaning we're going to distinguish this from the other rituals in the ancient world, cleansing rites, particularly those of Judaism. So that would make sense that he would use it plural. I mean, and like I say, that, that's caused some question, why does he do that? Now, laying on of hands, in the New Testament, laying on of hands is associated with prayers for God's protection and blessing. It's associated with healings. It's associated with appointments to certain tasks. It's associated with appointments to church office. And it's associated with bestowal of the Holy Spirit. So you have a lot of different occasions and things of the laying on of hands, but what seems to be the common denominator of them all is that laying on of hands involves the bestowal of a blessing. Okay, that seems to be, and that's, as Everett Ferguson indicates in the Encyclopedia of Early Christianity, that what unites these various occasions is that they all involve the bestowal of a blessing. Okay, so it seems to me, as I put these things together, it seems to me that the laying on of hands in this verse is a basic Christian teaching that involves bestowal of a blessing and is associated with baptism. Okay, that's how it looks to me. Uh, so I say, right, that, that kind of sets the parameters here in my understanding of it. So that makes me think that the early church taught that the gift of the Spirit that is bestowed in baptism was in some way associated with the laying on of hands that was part of the baptismal rite. Okay, before you faint, just listen to me. Okay, I think that's part of what's going on here, is that the early church, it was considered the laying on of hands, which was part of baptism, that somehow the gift of the Spirit that is given in association with baptism was in some way tied to that laying on of hands, which is part of the baptism rite. Okay, now the association between baptism and and laying on of hands is indicated perhaps most clearly in Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 7. 
Okay, in Acts 19, 1 through 7, regardless of whether the coming of the Spirit, remember the disciples that he meet, Paul meets in Ephesus? Regardless of whether the coming of the Spirit on those disciples was somehow distinct from the normal gift of the Spirit. Okay, that's not a, a, a question I'm addressing because it's not relevant to me on this point. Regardless of whether that is the case, the bestowal of the Spirit in that instance is linked both to baptism and to Paul's laying of his hands on them. Because remember, they come and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And they say, look, we didn't, even, we didn't even know there is a Holy Spirit. He says then, then what baptism did you receive? When they say about the Holy Spirit, they, they show ignorance. He wants to know then right away what baptism. All right, so clearly baptism in Paul's mind is connected with the receipt of the Spirit. Okay, so we ask him, he questions their baptism. He doesn't question whether anybody laid hands on them. But see, then you see that it, he asked that, but it's associated with his, it's linked to both, it's linked to both baptism and his having laid his hands on him, and that suggests that baptism involved or included the laying on of hands. Okay, there's a, a New Testament scholar, a fellow named James Dunn, his book, Baptism in the Spirit, he says, quote, baptism and the laying on of hands in Acts 19 are the one ceremony. You see, indeed, you can translate the relevant verses uh, here in Acts 19, you can translate those as saying, look, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and, Paul having laid hands on them, the Spirit came on them. They received the Spirit. See, Dunn says the laying on of hands is almost parenthetical. The sequence of events is baptism resulting in Spirit. Okay, so it looks to me like what is, what, that laying on of hands and human contact is part of baptism. It is part of the process. Now, unlike Jewish proselyte baptism, which may have been operating at this time, not certain about that, but Jewish proselyte baptism may have been practiced at this time, unlike Jewish proselyte baptism, in that the person immersed himself. You see, the person immersed himself, but unlike that, Christian baptism is done to someone by someone else. You see, a saint, the person being baptized is laid hold of by a saint, is buried in the water and then raised. It is a rite of human contact. And beyond that, the way we practice it, typically anyway, we hug the person, bring them out here, hold them, hold hands, hold their shoulder and pray. But in any event, it's a rite of human contact. So though we downplay, we don't pay much attention to the human contact aspect of baptism, I think we nevertheless practice it. It's inherent in the way we understand. I've seen a lot of baptisms in my life. All of them have involved human contact. All of them we place our hands on the person and baptize them. Now, I think in Acts 19, why he highlights the role, even though I think it's parenthetical, he says, and Paul having laid his hands on them. Now, you can translate that, in period, when Paul laid his hands on them. And that's how many translations do it, but you don't have to do it that way. You can make it this parenthetical thing, and I think the reason... The reason Luke highlights Paul's laying hands on, on the, the people in Ephesus, I think he's drawing a parallel with what happened in Acts chapter 8. I think he wants to highlight that. So I think that baptism involves the laying on of hands. It is a rite of human contact. We don't talk about that, but we practice it because that's how we've all learned how baptism goes. Okay, now that's what I think. That, and see, it, it is tied to, it is a basic Christian teaching that is linked to the bestowal of a blessing and is tied to baptism. That makes sense to me. That's what I think is going on. I offer that for you. Uh, okay, if you've got another way of having laying on of hands being a basic Christian teaching, have at it. You know, Godspeed. That's what I think is going on. Okay, now the third pair that he talks about, he says resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. See, repentance and faith toward God and baptism and the laying on of hands, these re refer to the internal and external the personal and corporate aspects of the beginning of one's new life with God, okay? Internal, external, personal, and corporate. This is the beginning of the journey. The last pair, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, are basic Christian teachings that refer to the end of the age. See, when Christ returns to consummate the kingdom He inaugurated at His first coming, the dead will be raised... Those who are alive at that time will be transformed and mankind in its resurrected state will be assigned for eternity to glorious life 
in the new heavens and earth or to horrible punishment in hell. This is basic Christian stuff. That Christ is returning and there is going to be a general resurrection. Resurrection refers to new bodily life. It refers to new bodily life. It doesn't refer to the mere continuance of existence in some spiritual or non-corporeal state. Okay, I want to read you a few quotes here from, uh, from a number of folks. You may, have, you may know the, the scholar N.T. Wright. He preached, he was a, a, a professor of New Testament studies at Cambridge for many years, written many books, but he spent a lot of time studying the meaning of resurrection in the ancient world. He wrote an 800-page book called The Resurrection of the Son of God. Okay, he has delved into how did ancients understand resurrection? What did it mean to them? Let me read to you what he says. This is from his book, The Resurrection of the Son of God. He says, we cannot stress too strongly that from Homer onwards, now Homer is 9th century B.C., from Homer onwards, the language of resurrection was not used to denote life after death in general or any of the phenomena supposed to occur within such a life. The great majority of ancients believed in life after death. They believed in a continuance of the spiritual existence. It says the great many of them believed in life after death. Many of them developed, as we've seen, complex and fascinating beliefs about it and practices in relation to it. But other than within Judaism and Christianity, they did not believe in resurrection. Resurrection denoted a new embodied life which would follow whatever life after death there might be. Resurrection was by definition not the existence into which someone might or might not go immediately upon death. It was not a disembodied heavenly life. It was a future stage out beyond all that. It was not a redescription of death. It was death's reversal. You see, that is what resurrection is. That is what it was. He writes in his 2008 book, Surprised by Hope, Rethinking Heaven, the Resurrection, and the Mission of the Church, he says, in content, resurrection referred specifically to something that happened to the body. Hence, the later debates about how God would do this, whether he would start with the existing bones or make new ones or whatever. One would have debates like that only if it was quite clear that what you ended up with was something tangible and physical. Everybody knew about ghosts, spirits, visions, hallucinations, and so on. Most people in the ancient world believed in some such things. They were quite clear that that wasn't what they meant by resurrection. While Herod reportedly thought Jesus might be John the Baptist raised from the dead, he didn't think he was a ghost. Resurrection meant bodies. We cannot emphasize this too strongly, not least because much modern writing continues most misleadingly to use the word resurrection as a virtual synonym for life after death in the popular sense. See, this is the idea. This is what is basic Christian teaching, the general resurrection. Jesus is coming back, and there will be a resurrection, bodily resurrection. Christ was raised bodily from the grave. So will we be. He is the first fruits of the end time resurrection. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23, our resurrection is tied to his. That's what it means when it says he's the first fruits. Our resurrection is tied to his so much so that Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.14, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus. You see, we're, we're part of the same harvest. He is the first fruit. We will be raised with Jesus. And so you see that in 2 Corinthians 4.14. We're part of that harvest. Likewise, we'll receive glorified and immortal bodies in the resurrection. Paul says it in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, Romans chapter 8, verse 23. It is clear from what he says in Romans 8, 29. He says it in 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 49, where they're asking, what kind of bodies will they come with, Paul? That was the whole point. He's trying, he's arguing against the idea that there won't be a bodily resurrection. He said, what kind of bodies will they come with? That's nonsense. And Paul says, look, God can handle it. He can't let Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, we see that 
we will receive glorified and immortal bodies as Christ's body. Okay, his resurrection body is the prototype or model of our resurrection bodies. Uh, how they will be patterned. That's why Jesus says in John 5, 28 and 29, that an hour is coming, okay, in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who've done good to a resurrection of life, but those who've done evil to a resurrection of judgment. They will come out. They'll come out just as Christ came out. He is the prototype. He is the model. And as I say, this is basic, fundamental Christian teaching. This is not some strange thing. This is not some late thing. Basic, fundamental stuff. Okay, so much so, let me read to you a quote from a guy named Roger Olson. He's a professor of theology at Baylor University. His specialty is the history of Christian thought. Okay, he wrote the book, The Christian Story, about Christian theology through the ages. Listen to what he says in his book, in 2002 book, The Mosaic of Christian Belief. The bodily, the bodily resurrection of all people at some time after death has played a prominent role in Christian teaching throughout history. In spite of a pronounced tendency among untutored lay Christians to focus attention on immortality of souls and neglect bodily resurrection, the fathers of the church, medieval Christian thinkers, and all Protestant reformers and faithful modern biblical scholars and theologians have emphasized the bodily resurrection as the blessed hope of believers in Christ. Now listen to this. It would be impossible to discover any single point of greater agreement in the history of Christian thought than this one. The future bodily resurrection of the dead is the blessed hope of all who are in Christ Jesus by faith. Over two millennia, the church's leaders and faithful theologians have unanimously taught this above the immortality of souls and is more important than some ethereal intermediate state between bodily death and bodily resurrection when Christ returns. And yet, as we lamented earlier, it seems that the vast majority of Christians do not know this and neglect belief in bodily resurrection in favor of belief in immediate post-mortem heavenly spiritual existence as ghost-like beings or even angels forever with the Lord in heaven. I told you, I've told you before, I remember many years ago when I was teaching a class at the White Station Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee, I was teaching young people, and I was telling them this, and it was shocking to them, and it just blew me away. I mean, this is pretty basic stuff. And yet they're sitting here, and we have neglected this, and that's what Olson is saying. That's what N.T. Wright is saying, that somehow this message has not gotten out. But it's basic, okay, that there will be a bodily resurrection. That is the Christian hope. New heavens, new earth, bodily resurrection, not like this body. Not subject to death, not subject to decay. The prototype is Christ's resurrection body. Okay, so this is important, and he mentions this as basic Christian teaching, um, the writer of Hebrews. Then in, in verse 3, he says, and we will do this if God permits. Now, the readers, you, you see these three pairs of teachings. They may have camped on these particular basic teachings because they were similar to Jewish teachings. You see, if you just bled out the Christian aspects of this and downplayed those, Maybe it would lessen the distance between your Christianity and their Judaism, and maybe the idea was we can ease the conflict. This is just speculation. I don't know why they camped on these basic things, but maybe that was it, that that's why they were doing it. But in the last verse there, you see that it's his, his hope and, and intention that's subject to God's will, that they will indeed move toward completeness, that they will awaken to absorb the meteor things that he wants to share with them. But he's not through with this exhortation yet. He's going to get back to his subject in chapter 7, but he has more to say in the way of exhortation. He says, For it is impossible to restore again to repentance the ones who have been enlightened, who have both tasted of the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and who have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the coming age, and have then fallen away, since they are crucifying the Son of God to themselves and holding him up to contempt for ground that drinks the rain often coming upon it and produces vegetation suitable for those for whom it is also cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being a cursed thing, the end of which is burning. So here we have, the, now this is the, 
In these hortatory interjections, you have a series of warnings. This is the third warning that we get in the book. Okay, he's, going, he's warning them now about the danger of falling away from the Christian faith. And it's important here, I think this word for, which the NIV and the TNIV for some reason omit, but this word for I think is important because it connects this section logically to what he's just said. Okay, he's been urging them to go on to maturity, to not stagnate in the ABCs. And then he says for... Okay, the logical connection, it's impossible again in what we just read. And it's important because, see, it's important for converts to move beyond the basics of the Christian faith, to move beyond the basics of Christian doctrine, because failing to do so, it not only increases the danger that they'll fall into sin and be alienated from God, but they they will fall beyond the point of no return. It increases that ultimate danger. You see, he's telling them, don't camp out there, go on to maturity. Don't just sit here and sit with the basics. I have something more to give you for. Then he tells them this, see. It increases the risk not simply of falling into sin and being alienated from God, but falling to this point that you can't come back. And so it's a very, very serious thing. I mean, the notion that we can downplay doctrine or dumb down teaching of the church to make the church more marketable to the lost without having some deleterious consequences on the body of Christ is wrong. Now this has been in vogue for a while, that we're going to pitch everything to people who know nothing about Christianity. That's what we'll do in our gatherings. We'll sit here and and we'll fix every, set everything to, well you can't use words like that because they don't understand it. You can't talk about atonement, they don't know what that means. So what do you wind up doing? You wind up talking to basically a first grader in terms of Christian doctrine. And you cannot do that without harming the body of Christ. I'm sorry, that's what he's saying. You can't dumb down the teaching of the church and think that it has no deleterious consequences on the body of Christ. Indeed, the Willow Creek Church, I'm sure you've heard about it, Willow Creek Church in South Barrington, Illinois, which was one of the, you know, the leading promoters of this uh, so-called seeker-sensitive services. That's what I'm talking about. We sit here and say, well, what we need to do, we, we need to make the church really so the lost come in here and, you know, they're in tune with everything. I even read, don't know if this is true, saw this on the internet, never able to confirm it, but uh, that's, that one group had taken the communion table and put it in another room because they thought that would be kind of confusing to people. I'm thinking, okay, you know, <laughs> if we're at that point, we've lost our minds totally. Okay, but, but you, see, you see what happens. But anyway, the Willow Creek group, which was one of the primary promoters, they acknowledged recently that, they're, that this approach, this theology light approach, was a failure, that the people essentially were starving theologically. Okay, and so they wind up, you know, there's plenty of stuff about teaching so that people not be, you know, reeds blown here and there, you know, deceived by every wind of doctrine. But we have, the, the, our culture has this idea, do, uh, doctrine, not doctrine, I don't, you know, I don't want to talk about that, I don't want to talk about theology. Oh, theology, everybody, that just puts everybody to sleep. Does it? See, this is the idea. You cannot just continue with basic stuff. You have to feed people. You have to help them see things. Now, one of the ironies of this marketing approach, which is spread everywhere. It's everywhere. People, it's like the church is a product, and I'm out here marketing, and I'm trying to figure out how can I sell it to lost people. But one of the ironies of the approach is that it was based on surveys of those who didn't go to church. You see, they based it on surveys of those who didn't go to church instead of surveys of those who didn't used to go to church and now are. You see, maybe you're not going to touch those people anyway. Well, this guy Tom Rayner, okay, this is his field. Well, he started surveying people who didn't used to go to church, but now do go to church. And you get a totally different picture that is completely at odds, okay, with the conventional wisdom of some of these groups, the church growth seeker sensitive movement. Referring to Rayner's book, his recent book, uh, titled uh, Surprising Insights from the Unchurched and Proven Ways to Reach Them, David Wells, he's referring to Rayner's book, but he writes in his book, the courage to be Protestant, he says, what were these people looking for in a church? Okay, Rainer, remember, he goes and he looks at the people who didn't used to go to church but now do. He's going to poll them and find out what what brought them instead of just looking at people who don't go to church. And he says, what were these people looking for in a church? 
If we believe all the church marketing hype, we would have to conclude that potential customers wanted, above all else, not to hear issues of truth and belief. These should be avoided like the plague. These are matters, the prevailing wisdom says, that should be hidden from seekers because they're so dreadfully off-putting. Not so. In fact, 90% of those in Rainer's study said that preaching was important to them. And not just any preaching. Almost the same percentage, 88%, said that what they came to hear was doctrine. <laughs> Be still my heart. They came to hear about theology, doctrine, truth. Okay? Well, we, you mean they didn't come because we had a nice fuchsia on the walls? You know, come on. Anyway, this is what they say. It says almost the same percentage, 88% said that they, what they came to hear was doctrine. The beliefs of the church were important to 91%. They wanted to know what the church believed. They wanted to have this laid out for them with conviction. This was their preeminent concern. The next issue of importance, the friendliness of the people, was far down the list. Only 49% cited it. Should we really be so amazed that people would like to know what Christians think and whether in this age of jaded, faded, transient beliefs there actually is something that can be believed for all time? This is what I think draws people. There is power in the gospel of Christ, in the word of God, in the message, and it has to be preached, taught, and it'll draw people. Amen. It'll draw people. But it has to be laid out. How can you say, well, I want to hear about this. This is life. There's no story like it. Amen. Nothing like it. And we can't continue doing this kind of stuff. See, we have to, we have to bring the body up. Teach it, preach it, and we have to do that. And it's difficult, it takes work, it takes labor and all that, but we've got to do it. Okay, now, those who may fall beyond the point of no return, he describes them in certain ways. They're ones who've once been enlightened. Okay, they at some point in the past, they had accepted the light of God's revelation in the gospel. They once were enlightened. Okay, now this quite possibly is a more specific allusion to the moment of their baptism. That's not Church of Christ talk. That's general, you know, Christian scholarship. Somebody like Bruce, somebody like Johnson, they say, you know, this very well may be a more specific reference to the moment of their baptism. Okay? And by the way, if we'd ever, you know, kind of get out read around some, you'll see that the idea of baptism, many, many people understand this, by the way, that this is the point of conversion. It's just a shame that in our world that we have some people running the wrong way. We've got you know, a world of scholars coming to say, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. And we've got people going the other way saying, no, it's not. It's uh, kind of odd, but that's another subject. Okay, so you have here, you, you see that the ones who have once been enlightened, those who may fall beyond the point of return are described as ones who have tasted of the heavenly gift. They've experienced the blessings of God associated with salvation. They're described as ones who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. They've shared in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they're described as ones who have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the coming age. They have experienced, they've tasted, they've experienced uh, God's precious promises and the, the endowment of various spiritual gifts and fruit of the Spirit that accompany the inauguration of the kingdom of God, the breaking into this reality of the age to come. That's what Christ has done. He has pulled the not yet into the now. And we share in that. We have a glimpse of that. You see here, and they had shared in that. We have the Spirit who lives in us, who is transforming us, yet we are in this overlap of ages where there still exists death, mourning, crying, pain, suffering, sin. But the day is coming when all that's going to be gone. You see, so he sits here and he's saying they've experienced, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the coming age. Now those who can't be restored again to repentance, they're described as those who have fallen away. Okay, they're described as those who've fallen away. But the, but the fact that they're beyond repentance, it makes clear, see, that the writer means by that something more than simply falling out of fellowship with God. As terrible as that is, he means something more than just falling out of fellowship with God. This is a falling out of fellowship with God that can't be remedied. 
Okay, it's more severe than falling out of fellowship with God, as terrible as that is. Now, we know that Christians can alienate themselves from God by sinning and yet be able to return through repentance. We know that. Well, how do we know that? Well, for example, the disfellowshipped are not in fellowship with God, but the act of disfellowshipping is intended what it is intended to be redemptive. It is intended to move them to repentance so they come back. You know, we're afraid of disfellowshipping people. But we have to disfellowship people who are living in impenitent sin. And you say, well, that's being mean. It's not being mean. It's being loving. This is how God has said the body of Christ calls people to repentance. We think, well, we got a better idea. Okay, we got a better idea. We have to do what he tells us. Now, nobody does it gladly, joyfully. But when a person sits here and says, who's a member of the body of Christ, winds up saying, listen, I know that stuff, you know. I know that I'm not supposed to be living with my boyfriend, but I like it. And I'm going to do it. Yeah, 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 I know I'm not supposed to be getting drunk and all that stuff, but hey, you butt out. I like getting drunk. I'm going to keep doing it. Okay, well, what's the church supposed to do? That's good. Come on in and be part of the body of Christ while you're poking God in the eye. What is the church called to do? The church has to disfellowship people. Okay? Urges them, pleads with them, begs them, repent, 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 repent. When they don't, the real repent squeezer is okay. You're out. The body turns and out. I think we need to have good fellowship for that to be effective. But anyway, you, you see this idea. So there is an alienation that exists that is, can be corrected, right? I mean, that's clear. From all the disfellowship passages, you look in Matthew 18, 15 through 20, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 11, 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20, you can see that there is an alienation that can be corrected. That is the very purpose of disfellowshipping, all right? But the writer is here referring, he's referring to a step beyond that. See, he's referring to a state in which the person is beyond being restored to repentance. So I know there is a state of alienation that can be fixed or repaired through repentance. And praise God. I know that that's the case, but he's talking about something beyond that, where the person is beyond being restored to repentance. He's giving a worst case scenario. You can get to the point where your repenting apparatus is broken. You can get there. Okay, and he's giving a worst case basis, a worst case scenario to stress the importance of moving toward maturity. He's telling them, look, you can't camp out on the ABCs for it is impossible to restore again. There is an increased risk if you do that. Not only will you fall from an, into an alienation that can be restored, you may fall all the way to the worst case scenario I'm painting. It's dangerous. It's dangerous to do that. And yet we have people saying, no, 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 we should do that. We should only teach ABCs because if you get into doctrine, then people are going to disagree. I know they're going to disagree. But can we teach some things? You got to. And I hope we can do it in the spirit of Christ. I hope we can understand when there are things that are, you know, where there's room for disagreement, okay. But I hope there are things we say, listen, no, we're going to teach this and this is, we're going to hold to this. Okay? So, but here he's doing this, he's emphasizing, he's stressing giving a worst-case scenario to stress the importance of moving to maturity. These people cannot be brought to repentance. They cannot be brought to repentance, he says, because by falling away, in the sense he means, I use the term falling away, I, I use it in common parlance just for somebody who's alienated, that I'm hoping will come back. The way he's using it, apparently, is deeper than that. He's using it in terms of somebody who's beyond repenting, And he he says that they can't be brought to repentance because by falling away in the sense he means they are crucifying the Son of God to themselves. They're crucifying the Son of God to themselves. In other words, they are ending permanently their relationship with him. In our vernacular, they're in effect declaring, Jesus is dead to me. That's how we'd say it. They're crucifying to themselves Jesus is dead to me, and meaning it. He's dead to me. Okay? So they're in that state. They're at that point. Okay? They mean that, and in that act, they're also holding Christ up to contempt, which is a further indication of the hardness of their hearts towards God. So this is a danger. Now, I think you can make people paranoid, okay, by sitting here and saying, listen, you know, you can fall, you can fall. You can. Look, I think this is an extreme case. 
I think people do get there, obviously. Okay, but I think many people, my assumption always is, I'll pull and plead and urge, and if that's where they are, then so be it. But I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, that guy's, yeah, he's over there, he's uh, beyond repentance, so leave him alone. Now, if the guy takes a swing at me, I may leave him alone. <laughs> you see, but I, I think that we as a body of Christ, we call everybody to reconciliation, right? No matter what they've been involved in, no matter how deeply they've gone into it. Christ sits here and calls, and that's what we do. Okay, call. Just, just repent. That's what we need. Okay? Yes, I know what you're involved in, but just repent and come home, baby. <laughs> just come home. All is forgiven. Okay? So, but there is this, this situation, and he's, he's urging about it. Now, the writer, he reinforces the point, the last couple of verses there, he reinforces the point with an illustration. That's what this is about. See, just as land that produces desired fruit is blessed by God, and land that produces only thorns and thistles is burned. So those who remain faithful and thus produce the fruit of faith, they'll be blessed by God, and those who abandon the faith will be condemned. That's what he's talking about here. That's the illustration that he's using to reinforce this idea, and what he's calling the people to is faithfulness, steadfastness, because this world throws a lot of things at you, and you see that in this case, what's happening to these people? They're being tempted to what? I'm going to leave Jesus. That's what's happening to our world. You've got people, ah, well, you know, this, this church is a tired thing, you know. You've got too many gray-haired people here. They're not cool enough. Or whatever it is. And they're trying to, trying to pull you up to say, listen, you need to hold firmly to the truth. Hold to the truth, okay? And that's what he's doing, and he's going to continue doing that. Thanks for coming.